Good morning and what a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, in the book, uh, The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis, he um, alludes to a number of different letters uh, that are from a senior uh, demon to a junior demon and really teaching him the art of how to tempt others. Uh, they're, they're quite um, fascinating and, and they really illustrate how, how often Satan would go about tempting us. Now, C.S. Lewis never wrote um, a letter that was, was uh, telling someone how to, how to tempt, telling the junior demon how to tempt uh, someone that was in Corinth. But if he did, perhaps he would have written something like this. I hear that your temptee has written, recently gotten involved in the church in Corinth. This is not as unfortunate as it may sound. That particular church may prove to be an effective distraction from him serving the enemy. They're filled with all kinds of pious ideas which they never put into practice, thinking they are super spiritual because of their spiritual gifts and holy thoughts. They neglect the real work of loving difficult people. In fact, they're split into factions according to who they follow and convinced that no one else can teach them anything. They minimize those whom they have responsibility towards and maximize those whom they have only disdain for. Many who we thought were lost have returned to us because of this church, since it is no different than the world they thought they were leaving behind. Corinth, as it's brought out in, in Paul's two letters, is a, is a very difficult place. One could think of it as an untransformed place. He addresses them as behaving in worldly ways in chapter 3. And it's to the letter to the Corinthians that we turn this morning. Paul really lays out the problem with the Corinthian church in chapter 1 verse 10. After his customary greeting and thanksgiving and the first part of chapter 1, then he goes straight to the point. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment, Paul deeply concerned about the division that this church was experiencing. But he doesn't wait long before he gives his antidote to the problem. From verse 17 of the same chapter 1, it says, For Christ did not send me to baptize. In other words, he didn't send me to, to, to make converts for myself, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. In other words, the power that these people will have to overcome the divisiveness of human nature um, and human sinfulness. The power that they have is the cross of Christ. He goes on immediately and says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the word of the cross is Paul's solution to the problems that face Corinth. We could go through and talk about the different challenges that they're facing uh, from chapter to chapter and just see how the word of the cross addresses each of these challenges. But the bottom line is the cross is Jesus coming down and taking on himself our sufferings. So he who was strong and great and mighty takes on weakness. He who was all glorious takes on shame. And he who is filled with love, therefore through uh, emptying himself, as Philippians 2 puts it, therefore is able to, to uh, minister to us and to, to make a huge difference in our lives if we have faith in him by dealing with the problem of our sin and by drawing us into the life of God. And so the way of the cross is what follows the word of the cross. So we need the word of the cross to lead us to live in the way or walk in the way of the cross. And really that is the climax of this letter. Um, so at the very end of the letter, um, in almost a summary of everything that he said, how do we respond to the issues that you're facing, the divisiveness and the different problems that you're facing Chapter 16, verse 14, let all that you do be done in love. That's the way of the cross, the way of love. And it's sustained by the word of the cross. 
And so you could almost say that the that chapter 13, where he really addresses the issue of love, is therefore the climax of the letter and is, is illustrating how the church should live. I know this passage is often preached at weddings, um, and not wrongly so, because it talks about love in general terms, but primarily Paul in this letter is concerned about the love that members of the church should have for one another. And as I say, it's really the climax of what Paul is talking about in this letter. So uh, we'll just be talking about verses four to seven um, in this, in this uh, brief message. And allow me to read uh, that, the, the whole chapter, just so that we can get a feel for the whole of what Paul is saying. And I'll start from uh, the second part of chapter 12, verse 31, because it really belongs uh, with chapter 13. And Paul says this, and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not, it is not uh, arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Now, as we delve into chapter, uh, to verses four to seven, I think it's helpful to note that Paul starts with a positive and ends with a positive, but sandwiched in between, he has a whole lot of negative things about what love is not. And I think that's instructive for us. It's not the main point of the passage, but it, it helps us to see how holiness is really formed in us. Holiness is following the way of God, following God's character. And that primarily happens as we really reflect on God's character, as we look to who God is. Um, and, and those words, patient and kind, are so consistently used to describe who God is. And we're going to look at that in a bit, uh, in a few moments. Um, and so, so Paul really is, is focused on the start and the ending point of what Paul has to say about love is the positive aspects of it. That is what we're to push towards. But Paul also recognizes that being sinful, being, being still in the body, in the body where we're not able to fully get rid of sin, there are some negatives that need to be subtracted also. Holiness is not primarily about removing the negative aspects of our character, but it must include that. So the Corinthians uh, must be warned that aside from being patient and kind, probably they have this idea that they're being patient and kind and yet they're, not, they're, they're perhaps envying or boasting or, or doing some of those other things that he warns against. And in fact, throughout the letter, he has, he has rebuked them for envying, he's rebuked them for boasting and, and so forth. Uh, so all of these negative aspects are things that they're doing that they might be oblivious to the fact that those things really are demonstrations of the fact that their, their model of love is not patient and kind. And so he brings both the positive aspect of what they need to look to, what they need to, to work towards, and the negative aspect of what they need to uh, you know, remove from, from, their, from their lives. Now, moving on from there, uh, there, there, there are broadly two categories of things. Love is patient and love is kind. We're focusing on the positive aspects because all of the negative aspects, I think uh, you can see, you can trace them to one or the other of those uh, of those broad categories of patient and kind. They're always failures to be either patient or kind. And, and so I want to look uh, with, with you at both patience and kindness. Uh, first of all, patience. And here um, I want to, to turn to, to, to Matthew chapter 18 um, and verses 21 to 35 
Uh, it's the parable of the unforgiving servant that Jesus gives. Peter comes up to him and asks him, how many times should I forgive my brother? As many as seven? Peter's amazed that someone could, could forgive someone else even seven times. And Jesus says, no, not, not just seven, but 70 times seven. Now, the point is not that on the 491st occasion of being offended, therefore we are allowed to, to, to not forgive. No, the point is uh, such a completeness of forgiveness. And then Jesus illustrates uh, the point by giving this parable. He says there's a king who is uh, now calling his servants to account. And there's a particular servant that owes him um, about, you know, 20,000 years worth of wages or a, a ridiculously unpayable debt. A debt that if he worked for his whole lifetime and all of his children worked for their whole lifetime and so forth, He's never going to be able to pay it off. And what does he ask? He asks, have patience with me and I'll pay you back. And the same word patience that, is, that was being used um, by Paul in 1 Corinthians. Have patience with me and I'll, I'll, I'll pay you everything. And, and the man, knowing that the, the guy could never, for, the king, knowing that the guy could never pay him back, forgives him the debt. That is, that is God's patience, that he forgives a debt that we could never pay back. And he does so through the cross, the way of the cross. And then the man goes out, the man who's been forgiven goes out and he finds someone who owes him maybe three months wages worth of money. And the guy has the same request, have patience with me. And the one who is owed that money, who has been forgiven his uh, unpayable debt, begins to choke him and say, no, pay me back what you owe or I'll throw you into prison. And the point of Jesus's story is if you recognize that you have been forgiven much, if you see what the Lord has done for you, there is no excuse for not showing the same patience to others. In other words, hearing and understanding the word of the cross leads to living the way of the cross. One other word about patience um, this comes from Romans 8.25. And here we see that patience is a fruit of hope. So he said, Paul says, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now, he's not really talking about the same kind of patience that Jesus was talking about. But I think the principle still applies that if we have hope, we're able to endure. And that's exactly what you see uh, back in 1 Corinthians 13 um, in, uh, chap in, in, sorry, verse, in verse 7. Love bears all things. Because it believes all things and hopes all things, therefore it endures all things. And so the way of the cross is a way of patience that is looking forward to and hoping in and believing for the reward. And we'll talk in a few moments about what that reward that we're talking about is. But let's move on now to kindness. So love is patient and kind. And here I want to turn to Luke chapter 6. Uh, verse 35 and in, in Luke chapter 6 we really have the record Luke's record of the Salmon on the Plain which is very similar to the Salmon on the Mount uh, but Luke uh, has Jesus um, the, 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 has, has rather the crowds gathered on a plain rather than rather than Jesus being up on a mountain above them and so and so as he's as he's talking he makes some comments about loving their enemies he says you know it's it's very easy for you to love those who love you that's we can see the same thing in, in, in Corinth. They're gathering into factions. Those who follow Kephas love those who follow Kephas, but they don't have any love for those who follow Paul and, and so forth. Um, and Jesus says, that, that's no credit to you. If you love those who love you, what are you doing different than anyone else in this world? What are you doing different than even sinners? But, and then, and this is verse 35, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the most high for he is kind same word he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil he is kind to everyone and his kindness is most fully expressed at the cross so again we're supposed to emulate god in his kindness and the way we emulate that is by hearing the word of the cross, which leads us to live the way of the cross, 
love your enemies because God also has loved his enemies and been kind to them. So we're supposed to uh, do the same. If you have experienced his kindness, live out his kindness. But then it's important to note God's kindness isn't uh, we, we sometimes think of God's kindness as, as some kind of unconditional, unending thing. Um, but, but, but Paul in Romans 2.4 mentions something that's slightly, slightly different than, than that perspective. He says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? In other words, God shows his kindness to us in order to confront us with the reality that we have not lived in the way that he would have us live and therefore lead us to turn our lives around as we as we see what the lord jesus has done for us as we see his kindness in taking on our burdens in taking on the 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 punishment that we deserve then that should lead us to repentance to turn our lives over to him and that leads us then into the last point uh, that we that that we'll be making today, and that is that that love is fruitful. Now I mentioned I mentioned that that really everything under the passage can fall under the heading patient and kind, but when he says it does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth, really those don't quite fall into those categories. They're speaking about something slightly different, and that that phrase I want to focus still on the positive aspects. That phrase rejoices with the truth is a really interesting phrase. Because it doesn't mean rejoice when, when the truth goes forth. No, it means the truth is rejoicing and, 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 and love rejoices alongside it. Um, and and an, an illustration of that that we can see is, is, is in Luke 15. Um, so in Luke 15, the Pharisees are getting mad and wondering, why is Jesus receiving uh, these sinners and, and, these, and these tax collectors and so forth? And Jesus tells them three parables to respond uh, to what is going on. First of all, the parable of the lost sheep, then the lost coin, then the lost son. And the point in every parable is, it's a great thing when those who had been lost are found, or that thing which had been lost is found. And so when the shepherd finds his sheep, he calls his friends and says, come, rejoice with me. When, he find, when the woman finds the lost coin, come, rejoice with me. Now, the, 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 the same word rejoice with is not in the, in, the lo- in the parable of the lost son, but the same principle applies. He gathers all his servants. He gathers his older son, who, of course, doesn't want to come. And he, he gathers them for a, 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 really a celebration of the fact that his son has been found. And the point then, when, when, when Paul says that rejoice, love rejoices with the truth, it's that the truth is, is pushing towards a certain goal in someone's life. The, the, the word of the cross is pushing towards a certain goal. It's pushing towards repentance, as we've, as we've mentioned. And when someone repents or when they come to the Lord or when they start living in line with the word or when they begin to be encouraged in the faith and, and, and so forth, then the truth has yielded its fruit and the response of, the, of love is to rejoice with that truth because love is really pursuing the fact that, that someone will be conformed to the likeness of Christ, that someone will become more and more Christ-like through repentance and faith. And so love is not only patient and kind, but it does this in pursuit of a goal. It does this in pursuit of the person, that they would be conformed to Christ's likeness. So love is also fruitful. It longs for the truth to do its work. So love is patient, love is kind, and love is fruitful. And it accomplishes all of that because it seeks to follow, it hears the word of the cross, it understands the word of the cross, it embraces the word of the cross, and therefore it is able to follow the way of the cross. Let me close by a story that um, Ravi Zacharias, the late... um, uh, was able to recount, and he he tells of an evangelist named Yaakov, who was witnessing to an older man by the name of Simon, who knew a great deal about the church and politics, and despised the hypocrisy he had, se- he had seen in the church. When Yaakov talked to him about the love of Christ, Simon said, "Don't talk to me about Christ. You see those priests there." with all their vestments, all of their cloaks, all of the big crosses on their chest. I know what they're like. 
they're violent people, they have abused their power. Don't tell me about Christ, I know what it is to like to watch them kill our people, even some of my own relatives. Yakov paused for a moment and then said, Zimmerman, can I ask you a question? What if I stole your coat and your boots, put them on, broke into a bank and took the money? I was chased by the police, but I outran them. What would you say if the police came knocking on your door and charged you with breaking into a bank? Zimmerman said I would deny it because I did not. Ah, but what if they say that they recognized your coat and your boots from a distance? You had to have broken into the bank. Zimmerman said, Yakov, just leave me alone. I know what you're driving at. I do, not want you to, I do not want to get into this discussion. Yakov went away, but he kept coming back only to live the love of Christ before him. Patience and kindness. Finally, one day Simmerman said, Yakov, tell me about this Christ that you so love and live for. How can I know him? Fruitfulness. Yakov told him how to commit his life to Christ. Simmerman knelt down on the dust outside his home with Yakov and received Christ into his life. He stood up and embraced Yaakov and said, Thank you for being in my life. You wear his coat very well. And sometimes those around us need us to wear the coat of Jesus very well. By living lives that follow him. Remember Paul said to the Corinthians, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And we should do the same. As we see the patience of Christ, it should sustain us to be patient. As we see his kindness, it should sustain us to be kind. And in the same way he was fruitful, our lives should also bear the fruit of people that because we were in their lives, they are increasingly resembling him also. So patience, kindness, fruitfulness. Let's pray. Our Lord and God, what a privilege that we can hear from your word. We confess that we have not um, loved others as we ought. Oftentimes we may convince ourselves that we're okay, but when we look at the high calling that Christ has put on our lives by the patience he has shown us, by the kindness that he has shown us, we realize that we fall far short Oftentimes we have great ideas in our minds, but we fail to live them out in the everyday business of life. But help us, I pray, O oh Lord. Help us as we reflect on the word of the cross to follow the way of the cross so that others may be built up, so that others may resemble you, so that our transformed relationships would transform the world around us and would bring in a great harvest of fruitfulness. We pray these things through Christ's name.